Welcome to the long-term investor, Carl Richards. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, Peter, it's an honor. I'm super jazzed about this conversation. I have been following your work for ages, and I even remember the first time that I lined up in a giant line to have you sign my book in Seattle at a CFA annual uh -huh. conference. And I'd watched you give a presentation doing your classic Sharpie sketches, but with an iPad and thinking it's just so incredible how you're taking all these big ideas and simplifying them down into something that's so digestible for people who don't want to think about this stuff each and every day. And so what I was hoping to do is kind of go through some of my personal favorite sketches. Now, obviously, everyone's listening. There are some of us watching on YouTube, but I'm going to have to do my best to describe the sketches. But fortunately, Carl, you so clearly communicate these things that I don't think I'm going to have a problem with that. And so with that in mind, I think perhaps your most famous sketch, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but right. it's one that I always see associated with your name, um, is a bar chart. And there are two bars. There's one bar that says investment returns, and it is towering over a second bar that is investor returns. And then you have what is the gap and you label it the behavior gap. So let me just start there. Pretty open-ended because you can go a lot of places, but what is the behavior gap? Yeah, I mean, look, that's such a good question. And this is it, it, one of the reasons that was one of the earliest sketches was become it is because it will become apparent it's kind of hard to describe right and it's a little bit hard to get your head around that that original version of the behavior gap so imagine um the original version of the behavior gap for me came from this realization and it sounds almost silly that there's a difference between investment returns and investor returns and and uh, getting your head around that is really, really important. And so the way I always explain it quickly is imagine if you opened the newspaper and there was an advertisement for a mutual fund and it said, you know, average annual, this mutual fund, this investment had a return of 10% a year for the last 10 years. It averaged 10% a year for the last 10 years. So we could label that chart, that bar graph 10%, you know, the average return of the investment was 10%. That's the investment return. But, it, and, and if you were to have put money in at the beginning of that time period and leave it there for the whole time period, not add or take anything and not add any money or take any out. And if we don't think about taxes or any sort of costs, you know, the question would become, what would your return have been? What would the investor return have been? Well, if you put the money in at the beginning, you left it there for the whole time, you didn't add or take any part, and we don't think about any costs associated. The, in that case, the investment return and the investor return would be the same, right? But who invests that way? You know what I mean? I, I mean, I know your clients do. But, for, but most of the world, right, we are always looking for the next best thing. So we're constantly moving money in and out. And we're often, we, we sometimes call it the hot dot, right? Like we're often moving money into the thing that just did well, you know, just in time for it to do its normal thing, some cyclical time where it doesn't do well. And then we sell it. We think we got to find a new one. And we repeat that over and over. And so what I learned early in my career was that um, this well-intentioned search for the best investment often just like naturally leads to behavior that costs us money. And I labeled that, that specific example was what the behavior gap started. But now I think of the behavior gap as any well-intentioned behavior that produces a suboptimal result, right? So anytime we have a well-intentioned behavior that produces it, and like, I've got to save, 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 maybe a well-intentioned behavior that causes all sorts of fights at home. That's a suboptimal result, right? Like I've got to be frugal and now you're retired and you can't ever even go golfing because you don't know how to enjoy your money. Like that's a well-intentioned behavior that produced a suboptimal result. So that's the way I think of the behavior gap now. I really like that. I, I like the way that you're phrasing it. And oftentimes our human instincts, which you don't need to feel bad about. I think right. it's important for people to realize when we talk about these human instincts that are the exact opposite 
of what you need to be doing to successfully grow your money with investments, they're very natural. There's no need to feel bad about it. But being aware and in, in, in talking and creating a platform where you say, oh, gosh, I do have that happen can be useful because a lot of what happens and results in us making suboptimal choices, as you put it, is just noise. And so I'm kind of curious, Carl, in your experience and all your conversations with people, why do you think it is that we pay attention to noise in the first place? Yeah. And, and Peter, thanks for saying that. Like to all the people listening, like you often hear people in the finance world, particularly as behavioral finance has become a thing. Um, there's often this, this almost like smug, like look at the silly people making the silly mistakes. And I think it's really important for us to understand like deep empathy for all of that. Like I, I make the exact same mistakes with, I'm really good at helping other people not make those mistakes with their money. And if I didn't have help, I would make the same mistakes because the it's, it's, we're hardwired to behave that way. Like it, it, some of those, some of the, some of that wiring has literally kept us alive as a species, right? To get away from things that cause pain and to want more of things that give us security or pleasure, right? That, that's, that's really important to heart genetic, like hard wiring. Well, the way it translates in the, in the investing world is for whatever reason, well, I know the reason it has to do with your noise. Like when you turn on the financial pornography network, otherwise known as CNBC, and you see people yelling and screaming, sell, 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 it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. And then you go to the club and you, your friends are selling. Well, it, you're tapping into now, and like that's now translated as that generates pain. And then we've got another behavior where we like to be part of a herd. Like if you... Like you've been told your whole life, keep your head down. Don't cause trouble, right? Don't stand out. And the, in some cases that's kept your family alive. And you know, like what happens if you get separated from the herd? So now we've got all this behavior mixed in that actually is counterproductive. And so the noise piece to me is just like, we are wired for novelty. We're wired to, to be scanning the horizon, looking for danger. And when something yells and waves their hands a lot and looks dangerous, we're wired to pay attention to that. And, and the same on the opposite side, sort of maybe the greed and excitement side. Like we're really like, man, if there's something exciting, something that can help me have more, something that can help me feel like I've got enough, something that help me feel like I'm going to make it through the winter, like where are the buffalo? Like all of that stuff, you're like, well, I'm going to pay attention to that. That looks important. Everybody else is doing it. And so, yeah, we're, and you know, that of course all changes once we realize that there's a big mis misalignment of incentives, that, that that's more like a circus, you know, an entertainment industry than it is valuable. But that's why I think we're attracted to noise is because we're, we're wired that way. And Carl, a lot of my job is to help create context for the noise that our clients are hearing, that my viewers are seeing and my listeners are hearing and reading. One of the charts, and actually I'm gonna look at it so I describe it correctly here. One of the, uh, I call it a chart, I should call it a sketch. What do you call your draw drawings? What do you it's call funny. them? You call, I we couldn't come up, it was such a problem. Cartoons, illustrations, that all implied a level of skill that I don't have. <laughs> We finally settled on like sketch. Sketch Here's works sketch. well. Um, there's one bar chart you have. There are three bars and it, the chart's titled what I need during a scary market. And the biggest bar is hugs. Mm. The next biggest bar, which by the way, is <laughs> less than half the size of the hugs bar. That one is facts. And then the last one is lectures. And it's actually going in the opposite direction, implying that it hurts and doesn't help right, at all. And Carl, yeah. this was yeah. actually a really big moment for me in a career where I'm giving people guidance and you hear a rustling in the bushes. And if we were cavemen and we don't have time to figure out the probability of it being a lion versus the wind, we just have to run. And for me to sit there and say, it's obviously not a lion. Lions don't live here. Those facts while true, aren't always helpful. And I think understanding the real human need that sometimes this stuff is scary. And sometimes money is confusing. 
I guess I'm kind of curious how you came about thinking about this, creating what I think is, again, probably one of my favorite sketches because it applies the most to my everyday job. What are your experiences um, that led you to drawing this? Yeah, I mean, thank you. That's really thoughtful of you to find. That's one of my favorite sketches. And I, I often talk about like hugs first, you know, lecture later, like hugs first, facts later. And, and here's the reason. Um, when you have a well-designed, and I know the type of work you do, right? Like, so you have a well-designed portfolio built on data and evidence, You've done some work to align that to the cl the client's values and goals. So, like as your listeners, you're you're thinking through like if I if you if you're investing like an adult is the way I normally phrase it, like well diversified. Your portfolio is designed specifically with your goals and values in mind. So there's a link there. Which, by the way, I'm not taking that for granted because most people that's not true. Most people, it's like a smorgasbord of investments. They heard something, they bought it. It's like a collection rather than a portfolio. But I know. That your listeners, and I specifically know the work you do, portfolio design is an intentional process. So if you've got a portfolio designed on purpose, and then a scary market shows up, which they do, and, and you are reasonably nervous, and please, like deep empathy, like I, I am too, if I turn on the news, there's a reason you're worried. Selling that portfolio doesn't make a lot of sense with the benefit of like how you were thinking when you were thinking clearly it doesn't make a lot of sense i would go so far as to say it's it may feel correct but it's factually irrational like it's just irrational so selling a long-term portfolio because of some short-term fear even though it feels like it's the end of the world some short-term fear that's an irrational decision so if, if we can like we could argue that all day long is that irrational or not but let's just for a minute, pretend like it is, we can agree it's irrational. What, what I think we need to realize is um, when we're in the middle of making an irrational decision, the last thing we want is somebody to reason with us. I like guess, like, try it with your teenager. Like, the last thing you want is somebody to reason with you. You know what you want? Is you want somebody to understand you. Right? And I actually get <clears throat> emotional about it because I see this so often. Like, can we just create a space where we can say, hey, John and Sue, like, thanks for calling. I understand why you're a little nervous. When I watch the news, I am too. Right? And, and, and so first, there's this sense of like shared compassion and empathy and a hug. And then, then maybe... We need to back into later, like, hey, would it be helpful if we review exactly how we got here, right? And, and I can look you in the eyes and say, I got you, but I do need to double check, like, are we still in the same place? And then that, then like some facts show up. But certainly the last thing we need, and I saw this a lot back in the day, you know, over the last 10 years on Twitter, where financial advisors would be like, don't be stupid and sell now. And you're like, that's, that's, that's the lecture piece. That doesn't help at all. Try it with your teenager. So I think what people want when they're nervous or scared, or they're, in an emo they're making an emotional decision. And this gets so confusing because we think it's all, we think that the money's all math, which is why I believe this is so important is because it's not. Like the, that poor, tell, what? You thought this was a math problem? You're worried about whether you're going to end up under a bridge. Hey, you don't want to be like your mom or your dad. Or remember when your mom used to come in and say, or your dad used to come in and say, don't be spoiled. Like all of those things are in your portfolio. It, and so I think it gets a little confusing because you're expecting it to be rational. And then you're a little confused as to why you're feeling so scared or why you're in an argument with your spouse or why you're yelling at one of the kids. And you're like, wait, this is emotional. And, and then we, so we got to feel that first. And then of course, of obviously like the work you do is deep mathematically, like, like that stuff's rockets. It's super important, but it's only important if it's linked to the values and goals. As soon as we get to values and goals, we get to emotion. And so I think that's how I think about that sketch. Well, I have no doubt that I'm going to talk about values and goals. Um, before I do, I, it, 
it does introduce me an opportunity to pivot a little from the investing side and dig into some of what I think you would agree are really important questions for people to think about themselves, for advisors to talk with their clients about. And if you don't have an advisor, that can be fine, but having some objective, trustworthy person to talk about these things. And so let me start with something I know you've written a lot about, talked a lot about, which is just simply, why is money important in the first place? Is because, um, I mean, I know why it's important to me. It's on the top of my one page financial plan. There's a little thing called a statement of financial purpose, and it says, time with my family, mainly outside, and serving in my church and my community. Like, that's why it's important to me. And, and as long as I can keep that in mind, these other decisions, while they don't, like, they're not inconsequential, and they're not easy, but they become much easier, right? Like, when the vision is clear, can't is like a Disney quote or something like when the vision is clear the strategy becomes much easier and so I think you know why is money important it, the answer like to your listeners especially if you don't work with an advisor like just well first of all if you work with an advisor go ask them to guide you through this conversation like tell show up and tell them like I want you to have here's a question I heard on Peter's podcast I need you to ask me and if you don't have an advisor have this conversation with a friend or a spouse and just think through like what, and the answers that often come first are like investment performance or I want to buy a second home or, uh, you know, th that's not a, those aren't really why, like, why do you want to buy the second home? Well, I want to create memories with the kids. Okay. We're getting closer, right? Like, why do you want investment performance? And I'll, I mean, I can take you real quickly through, like, I remember having this conversation with a, a couple and, you know, they had never thought about this because most people haven't. Actually, almost everybody I've ever spoken to hasn't. And we had this conversation, sort of, why is money important to you? And she, uh, her name was Julie, she said, um, uh, I think she said flexible, freedom, freedom. And I was like, oh, that that's good. And, like, we, we there's a consulting practice called the five whys. So it was like, go five levels deep. Freedom, I said, tell me more about that. Why is freedom important to you? And, and I'm shortcutting this. This is like a 15 minute conversation. Freedom. She said flexibility or she said freedom. Then she said flexibility. So tell me more about that. That could mean different things to different people. Why is flexibility? And she longer pause. And this is like a hard charging type A emergency room doctor. And she was the managing partner of the biggest emergency room, emergency department in our city. So like just, and if you know about emergency medicine, it's like you got to be on your game from med school on. And she was like, longer pause. And she says, time. Like, time. That's why money's important to me. And I was like, oh, let's pretend like you've got all the time you need. And we'll define that later, Julian. We'll call it a goal. We'll put some parameters around it. We'll call it a goal in a minute. But let's, for a minute, let's pretend like you're there. Why is that important? There's this longer pause. And she gets a little emotional and says, Cara, I just want to have a family. And I have not even had time to think about it. I was like, that, that's what we're talking about here. Like now it's so much easier for us to think about, well, how should the money be invested? How much should we be saving? What should we be doing? What does the insurance situation look like? All of those other things now suddenly have an anchor point because we've defined why it is important to you. I mean, I remember Jerry telling me, I just never want to be a burden to the kids. And we, we had to go deeper. But it was like, that's a great starting place. What does it mean to not be a burden to the kids? So that, that's, to me, how I think about that why. That's really great, Carl. I think people struggle to define their why. And mm. it's uh, I'm looking at a Venn diagram you've drawn where there's two overlapping circles. Um, in one circle, it's uh, use of your capital. In the other is what is important to you. And then the overlapping section in the Venn diagram you've labeled real financial planning. And mm -hmm. it feels like we're already talking a little bit about this, but why don't you uh, describe to me, how do you think about real financial planning? Yeah, I, I think real financial planning to me is that drawing. Like it's, it's, it's aligning your use of capital. And I, I now like an asterisk by capital. And the asterisk says time, money, energy, and attention. 
And you know, you often don't think of like attention or energy when you're thinking about financial planning, but those are all resources that we have and we want to align our use of capital with what we say is, and I should be careful here, with what is important to you. And uh, Peter, what just happened is I've been thinking of that word say. So align your use of capital with what you say is important to you. That's what I used to say. And I've been thinking about that word say for 10 years. Like that's how much, like uh, on some of these sketches, that's what goes into that. Like, I'm like, I've been bothered by the word say for like 10 years. Cause it turns out I don't actually care what you say is important to you. I, what I actually really want to help you do is align what your use of capital with what is important to you. And sometimes those things are not the same. And, and so I remove the word say now when I think about it. It's like align your use of capital with what's important to you. And the, the thing to understand, you said earlier, like very few people have thought about or get to define why. Please don't let that stop you. Like, like my dear friends, Peter's listeners, don't, I don't know either. And it, it's a never ending process. So both sides of this Venn diagram, your use of capital, so that's like how you spend it, how you save it. Like that is going to be a revelatory process. Every time you do it, you're going to reveal something about yourself and you get a chance to say, does that match with what I like for, for me, if somebody were to pull up my checkbook in the old days and my calendar, I'd be super curious if they could tell you, there's that old saying, the checkbook and the calendar never lie. I'd be super curious if they could tell you what was important to me. And what I hope they would say is time with my family, mainly outside and serving in my community, my church, but it's not often true. And I can either be so crushed by that and say, forget it. Or I can say, okay, what can I learn? How can I make a little tweak here and a little tweak there and realize it's never going to I'm never going to seal that deal. That, that Venn diagram will always almost have a gap. You know, every once in a while, it looks like those two circles are perfectly overlapped. So it looks like one circle. I, I mean, I remember that night. And it was Christmas Eve. The dog was on the couch, the whole family home. We've had our wonderful dinner. Everything's great. Perfect, perfect alignment. The next morning with all the gifts and I'm like, who bought all, what, how, what, how? like my wife keeps pulling stuff out and suddenly, boom, the gap opened again and I had to, deal with that. So that's how I think of that is this never ending process of goal discovery and alignment. Yeah. I think what's really nice about that process too, is there are a lot of successful people out there who make a lot of money, save a lot of money. Maybe they use an advisor, maybe they don't, but there isn't a clearly defined end game. Um, there's a sketch I've pulled up and by the way, for everyone listening or watching, you can go to the show notes at the longtermainvestor.com. I'm going to put links to the articles where you can find these sketches uh, and you can find all of Carl's great work, but there's a, there's a bar chart and one bar that's stretching out far says getting ahead. And there's a shorter bar that's enough. And I think it's a challenge for a lot of people to realize where enough is and what enough means. How would you suggest people get their arms around this idea? Yeah, just 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 run little experiments. It's really hard. Nobody ever, nobody taught us this. This concept of enough is like again one of my favorite topics right now. And how to? I would suggest that enough. I would humbly suggest that enough is not a destination. It's not a place you can arrive, and it's definitely not a number. I think enough is just something you have to be. And if, if, if it's ever a number, I promise you, <laughs> and this is, I mean, like I'm tempted to do it too. Like I actually don't even believe myself when I'm going to about what I'm going about to say is if it's ever a number, it will, you'll, it'll never be enough. Like I promise, I don't care what the number is. It will never, ever be enough. You'll get there and you'll be like, oh, that's not enough. And then the sad part about that is, it's a double whammy. Not only is it not enough, but you're actually disappointed because you, it wasn't what you thought it was going to be. I've had this convert. I, I don't know, but I believe I'm, I, I, I don't know that there's anybody who's had more conversations about money 
on the planet right now. I, and maybe I'm just in the top 10 or top 100, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But I've never had a conversation where somebody was like, oh, yeah, I thought once I had $3 million, it would be enough. And I got there, and it was. Like, I've never had that conversation. It's always the goalpost moving. It, there's science behind it, the hedonic treadmill. Like, there's always problems. So I would just suggest those are – we need to decouple that idea. If you're, semi, if you're psychotic with money, more money won't solve that problem. If you're insecure – with money, more money will not solve that problem. Those, those need to be decoupled. It's different, it's different kind of work. Now, once you've done that work, there's actually some really cool research that was just updated. Kahneman's research was just updated around the, the old rule we used to hear that like above, above 75,000, it doesn't generate any more happiness. And the update was, which was super fascinating. Um, I just read the research on this. The update was when you separated for emotional well-being, if you're emotionally miserable, like if you're the lowest tier of emotional well it was thirds, the lowest third of emotional well-being, um, there was no correspondent, like once you got to $100,000 in income, there was no corresponding growth in happiness with more income. In fact, it... It was it, it caused more problems, but if you were emotionally in the top one third of emotional well being, there actually was a corresponding link between happiness and more money, and that's probably I assume that's probably because you know how to spend it at that point, like you're spending it on experiences with people you love, you're spending it on contributing to the society, you're spending it on volunteering, and that will increase happiness. But so in other words, if you're if you're miserable. With a little money, you're not gonna you're gonna be even more miserable with more. And so we just need to decouple those two. Like do the work to figure out what enough is. And then and maybe a certain amount of money makes those conditions more favorable. The conditions of enoughness are a little easier when you have food on the table for sure, right? Like there's no argument there. But beyond that, they're they're it's we're expecting money to do a job it cannot do. Such an important point that you make. And I also like that you point out how those who are um, in a good emotional state of being also probably make good choices with their spending the money. And there's so much research on what type of expenditures tend to make us happy versus those that don't. You had mentioned experiences. Um, I'm firmly in that camp and I've seen the research there. Now, that doesn't mean everybody loves experience more than stuff. Um, but there is a lot of research that says that you're going to remember that great trip with your friends or family when you're lying on your deathbed not to get morbid than you are your most recent iPhone update or whatever gadget. But at the same time, you know, buying something that creates more time. Um, my wife and I have a standing babysitter yeah. every Saturday night. It is by far, I think, our largest luxury expenditure, but it's also one that creates time for ourselves. Um, you know, there's a lot of research that giving to charity yeah. creates research that finding ways to make it a treat, uh, creates a lot of happiness. And I think even something as if you know what you're passionate about life and Carl, I've followed you a long time. I know, you know, that you're passionate about certain things. Um, I've seen you write about buying a high quality bike because it makes you happy rather than mm -hmm cheaping out for lack of a better word and having to replace it all the time and, and not enjoying what is the thing that makes you so happy to be on this earth. So I think it's such an interesting point that you bring up there. Um, you know, as it pertains to enough, enough can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. As I transition pretty hard pivot here, um, we're talking a lot about the things that happen when you're really getting into real financial planning, real financial advice, something that I see you dedicating your time to every day to helping others help others. Um, kind of a multiplier effect on the work you do, Carl. Is there a way that you feel like people can identify when they are working with a real financial advisor versus someone who you wouldn't consider to be a real financial advisor? Yeah, that's such a good question. I got asked to write that. So the column for the New York Times ran every week for 10 years. I got asked to write that probably every year. And my editor and I once tried 
And in fact, before I started, he wrote a column on how to hire a financial advisor or financial planner. And he, he then followed that call. He, he took his own advice he, and he said he was going to do this in the column. He's like, I'm going to write how to do it. I'm going to use my own advice. I'm going to go hire somebody. And off he went. And a couple of years later, um, he got a letter from the SEC or some investigatory body saying, hey, your advisor has been doing bad things. And so it, my point is it always pointed to the challenge of finding, like building a checklist that out of the bottom fell like real or trustworthy or honest. It was always really hard. So here's the way I've approached it. Um, to me, there's just a couple telltale signs. They're not foolproof, like, but the type of questions I get asked in a first meeting so I think real financial advisors, real financial planners, whatever you want to call them, take the time to diagnose before they prescribe. So if you are in I mean, can you imagine walking down the street and you see somebody come in the other direction? They've got on a what looks like a white lab coat. As you get closer, you notice a stethoscope hanging around their neck and as you walk by on this busy street with lots of other people, they just slap on your chest a piece of paper. And you, that's weird. You grab the piece of paper and you look at it. You can't really read it, but you can tell it's a prescription. Like, can you... Oh, and then the next thing you decide to do is just walk to the pharmacy. You may as well. Like, walk to the pharmacy, fill... Oh, you got to sign a little waiver that says if, if you grow a third arm, you won't sue anybody. Like, and you're just going to take the medicine, right? Like, we would never, ever, ever do that. You would never, if, if you, and, and conversely, like you've been in a meeting with a, uh, uh, you've been in an appointment with a doctor and you felt thoroughly diagnosed and you've left with a piece of paper that you can't even read. You went to the scary place with the other people with coats and you gave it to them and they went behind the counter and they mix things and they come back and they give it to you. You sign a waiver that says, if you grow a third arm and you go home and you take it or even crazier, you give it to your seven-year-old daughter. And you didn't do, you didn't get a second opinion. You didn't Google the medicine. Don't ever do that and click on images. Like you didn't do, you didn't do any of that. You just took it. Why? Well, the only way you would have done that is if you felt thoroughly diagnosed and you had confidence that you were thoroughly diagnosed. If you got one whiff, because you've had this experience, I'm sure, right? Where you, you left with a prescription that you didn't fill. Because you're like, ah, that guy, I mean, that, that, he only took 10 seconds. Like, how could he possibly know? You go home, you get second opinions, you Google, and you're like, forget it. So that's, to me, I know it's not concrete. I know it's not a checklist. I know it's not quantifiable. But I would make sure I feel thoroughly diagnosed. And, and that largely is the questions. <clears throat> I, I really think real finance advisors often will go a full first meeting at least without making any suggestions. Any like specific, hey, here's what you should, the first meeting should be largely questions and listening, questions and listening, learning your situation. So don't hesitate to, I mean, here's one last example. I remember when we went um, to meet with an estate planning attorney for the first time we were leaving the country or, or something and we had th four young kids and, and we needed to just get our basic stuff in order. And we went and met with one of my friends who was an estate attorney and we sat in the lobby and filled out like 20 question questionnaire that started the annoyance. And my wife was starting to get really ticked. And we go in and he says, well, you can go one of four ways based on what I read. And he starts to lay out the four. My wife interrupted him and said, hey, we didn't come here to, ha to fill out a questionnaire and then have you give us four things that we're incapable of deciding on. We came here for you to take the time, which you have not done yet. Take the time to understand our situation and then make a suggestion. But before you make the suggestion, you should probably understand the situation. Um, yeah, we didn't end up using him and we're still friends, so it's fine. But, but I think that to me is how I would think about a real financial advisor. Do they diagnose? Do you feel thoroughly diagnosed? Do they understand you? Could they write your statement of financial purpose? Could they tell you your why? Or at least a first guess. Like that's how I would think about it. Great stuff as always, Carl. I'm going to describe one last sketch before I let you go. There's a box with the words your advisor inside of it, and it rests between the words you and the big mistake. And I think it's hard to argue mm -hmm. 
that people wouldn't benefit from professional advice in any endeavor, not just investing or finances. But I think when it comes to hiring an advisor, people are often focused solely on the tactics that a financial advisor offers and executes. But it's so much more, and I feel like we're just scratching the surface here, but how do you feel like where an advisor adds value beyond those tactical measures that are often quantitative? And what's the qualitative thing that you feel like is most important? Yeah, that's a super fun question. So first, I think you, it, like all your listeners should understand, if you um, don't see the value of a financial advisor, you're not alone. Because what you've run into most of the time is what I would refer to as the fake ones. Most of the industry speaking large, like all the noise, it's more like a circus and a carnival. And boy, can it be hard to navigate. Like I remember when I first got into the business, I couldn't figure out, like, what does the person at the bank do? Like, what's the difference between an insurance person? And like, I had no clue. And it's still often hard for those of us inside the industry to figure out who, like, I, it's hard for me to sort out who I would send my mom to, right? But there's this whole group of like, I call them like the secret society, you know, of real financial advisors. They're like secret. They're like hard to find. They don't have million dollar marketing budgets. They're not running around making a bunch of noise. They're just busy doing really, really professional work. And that's what I'm referring to. So what they add, and, and this was, this, that sketch was a result of during the book tour, I was on a, a bunch of radio and TV shows and somebody asked me like, Carl, you, I've heard, I read somewhere that you have an advisor. You are an advisor. Why would you need, why would, why should we trust you? Why should we read your book if you need an advisor? And I was like, oh man, like, I, you know, I've miscommunicated somehow because, uh, uh, you know, like, I, let me explain. Here's the three reasons. So the three reasons were, number one, help me clarify my goals. And that was just what we talked about earlier. Like, it, this, that's a never, goal clarification. Goal is not even the right word, but it's like the best placeholder we have. Help me clarify what's important to me, number one. Number two, remind me of what I said was important to me when I'm thinking about doing something silly. And that could be spending, that could be blowing out of a portfolio, that could be like whatever. Just Would you just remind me, sometimes with a punch in the nose, but mostly with an empathetic hug, right? Can you just help remind me what I said? And the third thing was, and this is my language about myself, it's not on that sketch. The third thing was, be the thing between me and stupid. Right? I, I want an advisor to be the thing between me and stupid because I, I know I can show you the stupid mistakes I've made with my own decisions. I need something between me and stupid, just a pause between the stimulus and the response. And so I toned that down a little bit for the sketch and said, you know, the big mistake. And so I think it's really hard for a real financial advisor to explain what the thing is going to be that they're going to help you avoid, like forget all the positive things they're going to do. The big, I, I have found that the, and they come in, they, they, they come in frequently, but they're big. Um, the big events are, uh, su super quick story. Um, I had these ER, two ER doctor client. They're both, no, she was, he was ER. She was um, uh, whatever it is, disease, patho pathologist. And they were super smart and they'd been clients for a really long time and they called once. And this is now quite interesting. Is it 2003 when SARS? I think it was yeah, 2003. 2002, 2003. Yeah. Yeah. They called and were like, and I hadn't heard anything. Normally we'd get, you know, a couple different people would call or, but they called and were like, we want out of our portfolio. Please sell everything. And I was like, whoa, why? Like, don't you know? And I was like, no, actually, I don't. They're like, SARS, it's going to be a worldwide pandemic we want out. And she was a pathologist, and he was a doctor. So I was like, okay. I said, but wait, like, can we, you know, first, empathetic hug. I can see why you'd be super nervous about this. If I had read that, I would be nervous too. Would it be okay if we reviewed what we had decided? We reviewed their goals, the, you know, time time with my family. Like we got to their why we reviewed it. Is that still true? Yeah, that's still true. 
And I said, okay, well, based on that, we built this portfolio. Do you remember why we built it? Like, here's the pieces and here's how it works together. And by the way, nothing's changed. And I remember saying to them, like, hey, if, if you guys were gone for three years, if you were telling me uh, we're going to leave for three years, we're not going to be uh, reachable, Carl, take care of things. Uh, I would just have you stay put based on everything we talked about today. Like, I know it's not the perfect answer. The perfect answer is let's sell before it goes down and buy before it goes up, but we can't do that. I'd just stay put. So would it be okay if we just, like, I'd have no problem with the idea of just staying put. And they're like, yeah, 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 that's fine. Let's stay put. And I remember I, I was sort of curious. I just marked the value of the portfolio. And I said, a day later, I called and said, I remember his name, but I, let's just call him Steve. I, I called and said, hey, Steve, will you do me a favor? We've decided to stay put, but just call me when you think the coast is clear. Like if we had sold, call me when you would want to get back in. But again, we're not selling, but just call me. And yeah, a couple weeks, a couple months, I can't remember what it was. And I looked, it was $54,000 different. Like their portfolio was $54,000 higher they had made $54,000 by staying put. How do you tell that to someone? That's what I think. That, like, that's, that's the kind of big mistake I'm talking about where I don't know. I had no other client who wanted to sell during SARS, not one. So that was a very unique to them. It could be like something going on with the family. It could be a buy-sell agreement with the business. It could be an appreciated stock that you donate instead of sell and donate cash that you hadn't thought of. There's all these things you don't know and I don't know because they're blind spots. And by definition, you can't see your own. That's what a real advisor does, in my opinion. Well, Carl, thank you so much again for joining me here today. And as I mentioned before to everybody watching and listening, you can go to the longterminvestor.com. I'm going to put links to some of the different sketches that we've been discussing. You can then see all of Carl's work uh, there at his website. Carl, is there anywhere else people should go to find you? No, that's the best. Our weekly, the Behavior Up weekly letter is probably the best place. So if you just go to behaviorup.com and you can sign up for the weekly letter. I'm on the letter myself, full endorsement that it is mm, well cheers. worth your attention. There is very... Everybody's vying for attention these days. Um, it's one of the most valuable signs of trust. And so ultimately, you know, I trust what Carl puts into your inbox every week. It's really great stuff. I think it'll make you view the world through a better lens than if you're reading the paper or watching the news all the time. Mm. Carl, again, thanks so much for joining, for everyone watching and listening to Long-Term Investing. Thanks, Peter. It's an honor and please keep up the work you do. It's a gift for all of us. Yeah.